I uh, go on, uh, I actually want to uh, finish a few um, uh, a few other comments about this, uh, this, this story. So, so far, there is no connection. I haven't said the word, I mean, I've said the word a few times. You don't need to know anything about cluster algebras or anything like that um, to follow the story. It's just very simple things about the wave equation. <clears throat> but I now want to start talking about what we've done here in a way that's going to prepare us um, at least uh, for some aspects of, of what we're going to see in connection with cluster algebras, which is also interesting uh, all, all by itself. So let me go back to this, um, uh, let me go back to this, uh, uh, to this uh, picture. And um, tonight I want to talk about a different, uh, I want to talk about a different point. Up to this, up to now, um, the way we have solved for the variables inside the diamond was just using the Gauss law conditions, right? That, that's fine, that's perfectly fine. Um, but, uh, but there's obviously, there's another physical way of sort of solving for everything inside, which is what we normally do. You sort of solve with time evolution, right? So in this picture, it's like you, we, we imagine that we're given the initial values of the x's here. And I just want to sort of gradually move this uh, Cauchy surface where the data is given to solve for the next x's as I go along. Okay. Now, what does that mean? That means that uh, that, that that means that um, uh, I want to find the first variable I can solve for with the smallest one of these Gauss's laws, these smallest pixel Gauss's laws. Um, so, what is the first variable that I can solve for? See, like in in this picture. Uh, I start off having given values one, two, and three. You see that I can solve for that guy. I can solve for that corner using the uh, Gauss law for this little mesh. I can't solve for any other corner, but I can solve for that one. Okay, so that means in the next step, I've solved for four. Okay, and, and I'm just extending the uh, line here. Remember, it's zero on the left-hand side, so it doesn't really matter. I'm, I'm doing it... Um, uh, I'm, I'm doing it so that we step up in a way so that we eventually cover the whole space. But drawing the rest of this red line doesn't really matter for this, uh, uh, for this uh, uh, discussion. Um, what is the next variable that I can solve for? Well, now having solved for four, I can use this little mesh to solve for that guy up there. Okay, so that's what I did. There's variable five. Then I can solve, use this little mesh to solve for variable six. And now you see I have some choices about what I can do next, but I've chosen to use this mesh here to solve for variable seven. Then I can solve for that variable eight, then I can solve for that variable nine, and then I'm done. So what I've done is find a way to solve the wave equation by time evolution, starting from the initial data and taking one time step at a time to sweep through the entire space time, starting from the past and going to the future. Okay, now I want to talk about what we're doing there I want to talk about what we're doing there uh, in a in a in a slightly more abstract way uh, that will then generalize. What I'm going to do is I'm going to keep track of the Cauchy surface that I'm on. I'm going to keep track of what it looks like by drawing the following picture. I'm going to draw, for example, in this initial slice, I have variables one, two, and three, and I'm going to draw a little quiver, which is just a, a directed graph, a graph of directed arrows. Okay, so. Uh, but the, the uh, directedness is that there's an arrow from A to B if A is in the past of B. That's it. So here you see one is in the past of two is in the past of three. So the quiver for this guy is X1 with an arrow to X2 with an arrow to X3. What is the quiver for this next guy? Four is the future of two, which is in the past of three. So this is the arrow is into four, out of two, out of two, and into three. And so on. Okay, so I can draw one of these quivers associated with every one of these sort of Cauchy surfaces as I move through the space time. And now you can see that what I'm actually doing also, uh, I'm solving for a new variable, uh, a new variable uh, like x4, other variables as I go. Um, so uh, what is the rule for going from one picture to another? Well, you see what the rule is is that if you have something which is purely a source in this picture, if, the, if there's an arrow coming out of it, then you just reverse the orientation of that, of that arrow. Okay, so you see, that's how I go from this picture to that one. I take this X1, that's just the source, and I reverse the orientation of this arrow. Now X2 has two arrows going out, so I can reverse its orientation. 
and I get to this picture, which is exactly that one, uh, and so on. So what I'm doing is starting with this quiver, and I am walking by just uh, hitting any vertex, uh, which is purely a source, and reversing the orientation of all the arrows into it. Okay, so, so what I've done now is, is abstract away from this picture of the whole kinematical space-time, a little quiver, and then with a rule for how I'm walking from one quiver to the next one. Okay? And finally, there's a formula that tells me what the new variable is in terms of the old one. The formula is just the Gauss law relation, but the Gauss law relation is now written as uh, x plus x prime equals left plus right. Here, it's that, that the, uh, when, I, when, I, uh, when I touch uh, a vertex and I switch the arrows going into it, that process will be called more generally mutation later when we talk about, uh, uh, when we talk about uh, quivers and uh, cluster algebras. Um, we also have a relation involving x plus x prime. And the Gauss law relation here is simply that x plus x prime minus the sum of all of the variables that connect to x is equal to, uh, is equal to a c, is equal to that uh, uh, constant. Okay, so remember, x has all arrows going out, so it's x plus x prime minus the sum of all the arrows, all the w's that are connected to the x with the outgoing arrows is given by some positive constant. Okay, so now that is, uh, that's what time evolution looks like in this kinematic space, and we've abstracted it away a little bit to a statement about uh, uh, mutating quivers. We start from one quiver and then we go to another one, one step at a time, only acting on sources as, as, as we go. Okay. All right, so before I get to this uh, picture, um, uh, let me go back for a second here. Now, there is one interesting thing that we need to uh, think about. Um, you see here, what, what I did in this picture is tell you how to interpret the time evolution of the space time in terms of the equivers. But um, it would be interesting to sort of go all the way and only ever talk about, see if we can only ever talk about the uh, quiver. Well, the one thing that's missing in this picture of the quiver is that we don't know when we're supposed to stop. See, I could just keep doing this game forever here, whereas from the side of the, from the, side of the kinematical space time, it's clear that I should stop somewhere. So let's try to get some idea of when it is that uh, uh, what 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 what's interesting about about uh, stopping where we stop here if we all we ever knew were these rules about the uh, quiver, and there's actually something quite quite beautiful. Um, there's there's uh, something that you can think of. I mean, this is in a very rough analogy. Um, uh, it's a kind of time evolution. We also have to have something like an entropy grow. This is a very, very loose uh, under time evolution. So this entropy is not the entropy in any standard sense. Well, I'm gonna tell you precisely what I, what I mean by it now. Um, so let's look at the simplest example. Um, uh, we, we would have done this for, for, the, for the Pentagon. And so if we did this for the, if we did this for the, uh, uh, for the, for this example, um, now, our starting quiver would have just been, um, uh, let's say, x, let, let me call it x1 and x2, just two points here and just an arrow between them. And now, you know, I would go from here to uh, x3 and x2, where x3 plus x1 minus x2 is equal to a constant. And then I would just keep, keep on going. I would go from I would go from x2, I would flip it back again to some x3, oops. Let me put it here, if I, if I touch x2, I would now have <clears throat> something like this, x3, x4, where x4 plus x2 minus x3 equals some constant <clears throat> and so on. And I would hit this, and I would get x5, x5 plus <clears throat> uh, x3 minus x4 equals some constant prime. 
And that's officially where we're supposed to stop. Remember, we only have three relations in this picture. But we actually get a quite beautiful picture of what's actually going on um, from the perspective of our, of, of our polytopes. So you can think of it in the following way. To begin with, all we know is that x1 and x2 are positive. So to begin with, we just know that x1 and x2 are positive. And so I just have this infinite space that I can live in. In the first step, I solve for x3. In the first step, I solve for x3. <clears throat> and so that means that I have some extra constraint that also x3 is positive. So after the first step, um, I know more. I know that uh, also x3 has got to be positive. So I, so, I, so I have to be above this new line. So the space is infinite, but it's still infinite, but it's starting to get carved out. Okay? Uh, now in the next step, I learned that x1 is, in the next step, I learned that, uh, um, uh, sorry, I think I, this was x4. In the next step, I learned that x4 has got to be a positive, and that just keeps putting more and more constraints on, on this picture. So in the next step, uh, I know I have to be there, but also that I have to be there. Okay, so, and it's, it's still infinite um, in one direction. And finally, in the last step, I close up the entire space. So only at the last step, only in the last step do I finally get a closed space. And now you would see what would happen if I kept going. If I kept going after that, I would start cutting into the space further. And in fact, you can, you can show that as you cut into the space further, the shape first, it's unnatural to cut into it further. And secondly, the shape that you would get would depend on the details of what all these constants are. Whereas the shape that you get here for the case of uh, up to the Pentagon is completely invariant and independent of that. We can actually say that, so, so that's sort of what's going on you know, in practice. We know in the end we're getting a polytope. We can, uh, we can begin, we can forget about the kinematical space time and just begin by playing the game on these quivers. And as we do that, we start building this polytope, but it starts infinite, 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 but it gets carved out more and more and more. And we have to stop at the point where, uh, where, it's, uh, where it's done, where it's made finite and done for the uh, first time. In fact, we can say this all slightly more invariantly. Um, Nima, so sorry to interrupt, but have you tried traversing in a different order uh, from what you're doing, so not with the time evolution? Well, you see, that, that's, that, that, was, that was one interesting point. Let me go back to the, uh, let me go back to the picture is that uh, the, the rules that we're talking about tell you that you're only allowed to, I mean, what corresponds to a time evolution here, the rules correspond to, to just mutating on these sources, okay? Um, and uh, in fact, I alluded to an example earlier here. It's not always unique how you can do it, and we're familiar with that. You can move Cauchy surfaces in many ways. If we, uh, already in this picture, you can see it. If we drew a larger picture, you would see it. In intermediate steps, you can have choices of where you decide to mutate as you go, how you choose to move these surfaces around. However, they all have to satisfy this rule that you're only mutating at a source. It's just that it's possible in some places you have more than one source. And so then, uh, so then, um, uh, so then you can decide which one you do. You can do, you can do them in uh, any, any order you like. However, you do have to mutate only on these sources. That's our, that's our notion of uh, time evolution. And that's what corresponds to sort of Cauchy evolution in this, uh, that's what corresponds to Cauchy evolution in this uh, space time picture. Um, but I want to actually say a, a little more invariantly what is happening. Um, a little more invariantly what's happening is that we start with this, uh, we start with this uh, uh, kind of infinite polytope, just the, just the interior of this upper quadrant. Um, so it's uh, interesting to just sort of plot what the normal vectors look like. Okay, so here's the normal vectors to the faces that we have. So the normal vectors start off looking like this. Okay. Now, in the next step, in the next step, we got something like that, if you recall. So now it's still infinite, but I have one more normal vector. There's one more normal vector. Let me plot that guy. You see, the interesting thing is that this new normal vector is outside of the positive span of the old ones. So the two old ones, you know, everything that I can make by taking a positive linear combination of them, in other words, everything inside this cone, 
The new one is outside the cone made by the old one. Then I get the next one. I got this guy. And there are two. The new one is outside the cone made of all the previous ones. So as I keep going here, I keep making larger the space that's covered by all these normal vectors that I'm, uh, that I'm getting. Until finally, at the, at the last step here, I get this normal vector. Okay, so, and now you see we're in an interesting place because if I do anything after this, if I do anything after this, I'm going to have a new normal vector, and that new normal vector is necessarily going to violate our rule, or going to violate our observation that every new normal vector that we get is outside the cone of all the um, of all the old ones. So that's the fundamental rule. Uh, I've now given you a rule purely uh, phrased in the language of this uh, quiver that says that you start at a source, you mutate at the source, you write down the equation x plus x prime minus x equals constant. As you go, you just plot the normal vector you get for every new wall of the polytope, and you are only allowed to do a mutation that has the property that it increases the sort of span of all of those vectors. It always has to be like this picture. It gets bigger and bigger, and at some point, eventually, at the very last step, you will stop and close up the entire space, and then you're not allowed to do anything more. Okay? So, we have now abstracted away the rules of time evolution into simply a statement about these uh, quivers. Okay? And so that means that having done this, we can now, uh, we can now uh, uh, do uh, quote unquote time evolution. We can do this for any quiver at all. In fact, uh, to literally do uh, the rule uh, that we're talking about, we have to make sure that there's at least somebody who's a source. So that means that the quiver should have no loops. That's acyclic is a fancy word for no loops. But if you do have a quiver, for example, if it just looks like a tree, here's an example. Here's a random example of a quiver. And now, I can, I can play this game. I can have x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, x6. And now I can choose any source like this one and I can keep on going. So I, I, would, write down, I would write down like uh, x7 uh, plus x2 minus x3 equals a constant and I would keep on going, okay? Um, so we have now defined uh, we've now sort of abstracted away what we've done in the kinematic space time to a setting that we can apply to any quiver. Um, and now there's a remarkable fact. Now this is actually a game that you can play. I mean, you can just play it with Mathematica. Just, just see what happens. Um, and there's a, there's, a, there's a remarkable fact. The remarkable fact is that uh, that this process terminates, as, as it did in our example, right? This process terminates almost never. In other words, it's for very, very special quivers. Only for very special quivers. And the very special quivers have a very simple characterization. The quivers are actually just Dinkin diagrams. The Dinkin diagrams associated with the classification of Lie groups. Now that's surprising. It's not obvious that this question has anything to do with the classification of, of uh, Lie groups, but that's what the answer, uh, that's what the answer turns out to be. Um, what, what I mean is, for example, if you take the quiver that we're used to seeing for the SUN gauge group or the AN, uh, if you know about the uh, 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 usual Dinkin diagrams, um, that's a, it, there, it's not a, not a quiver, it's just a, it's just a picture with nodes and, uh, and edges linking them, but you get to put orientations on it any way you like. 
Okay, so you can put any orientation on, on this and that will give you something that stops. But you can also do this one. And so that's the DN quiver. And that also gives you something that stops. Now, the rules that I told you uh, don't tell you what to do with a situation where you have double arrows, like we're used to in, uh, uh, for example, if I'm talking about DN or CN, SO or SP, but there's a very slight modification of the story I told you where you allow integer coefficients in the X plus X minus X relations. So I could have X plus X minus two X. Um, it's always X plus X, but on the right-hand side, I can have some uh, integers. If you allow integers other than one, then you just find uh, the, all, the, all the possible uh, quivers that, that eventually stop are in one-to-one -one correspondence with uh, Dakin diagram. Now, so that's, that's, a, that's, that's, a quite, that's a quite beautiful fact. Um, uh, as, we'll, as we'll say in, in a bit, uh, the story of cluster algebras also has, uh, in, in fact, this is where, uh, this is the origin of what I'm just uh, telling you about, uh, that, that the cluster algebras come in various types. Uh, there, there are finite types and there are more generically infinite types. And the finite type ones are in one-to-one -one correspondence with Dinkin diagrams. And exactly the story that I've told you about, abstracting away time evolution from, from kinematic space to this walk on quivers is a realization of uh, polytopes associated with all the finite type cluster algebras. Um, and uh, <clears throat> um, uh, phrased in this language of, uh, as I said, abstracting away from uh, time evolution in uh, kinematical space, but the, the picture that was written down by, uh, uh, but the, 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 the formulas, the representation was written by uh, uh, Hugh Thomas and his uh, students. Okay, now, um, so, so, so we've sort of abstracted away from our uh, picture of kinematical space, something uh, to this more general notion of time evolution. Uh, but now I actually want to tell you that factorization also continues. So there's a version of factorization for all of these stories. Uh, so now I'm just telling you facts, but I, I hope you at least find the facts uh, plausible. So in all of these cases, we have some polytopes. So we have some, we have these polytopes that are associated with thinking diagrams. Now, uh, we know we know that in the story of the isosahedron, that the an isosahedron factorizes on its boundaries to some an one cross an two, and where n one plus n two is n minus one. So, uh, how do we see this? How do we? Uh, uh, well, can we interpret this in the language of the Deakin diagram? Well, sure. A n is just this chain. And so factorization just corresponds, the way that it can factorize on its boundaries, factorization just corresponds to removing a node of the Deakin diagram. So you see, if you remove a node for A n, well, it just splits into two lower ANs. So that's, uh, so, uh, so we see from the picture very vividly why we have uh, factorization. Now, what could these other, what could these other Dinkin diagrams mean? We, we, we know that AN is related, we know that AN is related to, uh, so, so this Dinkin diagram, no, this is related to amplitudes in the by adjoint theory. What could DN possibly mean? So DN looks like this. What could this possibly mean? In fact, DN will end up being one loop amplitudes, or the integrand for one loop amplitudes in this, in this uh, bi-adjoint theory. And uh, we can see a motivation for why that is if I think about uh, what the factorization should look like for DN. So the factorization for dn is, well, I can either, for example, remove one of these nodes, like I can remove this node. Maybe I should remove a later one. 
remove this node. And what do I get? If I remove uh, this node, I get a DM1 cross AM2, right? With N1 plus N2 equals N minus one. So that's one kind of factorization. Um, then we have another kind of factorization. I can remove this, uh, <clears throat> I can remove one of these antennae. If I remove one of these antennae, that's a little more interesting. That's just an AN again. Okay, so now, now we're looking at the sort of factorizations of DN. Well, one kind is DN prime cross AN double prime, but the other one is just another AN. The n will go down to an minus one. Um, who is this? Well, who are both of these guys? Well, there's a very natural interpretation for both of those factorizations. We know that a one loop amplitude can have factorizations where it's one loop on one side and tree on the other side, just by a normal kind of tree propagator going on shelf. So that's a, that's a very that's a very standard kind of uh, uh, that's an obvious uh, factorization. Uh, so let me sorry, let me write this a little more nicely. Sorry. Uh, so so we have these possible factorizations of, of dn. dn can go to dn1 cross an2 or it can go to an minus 1. And this first type in the language of amplitude is reminiscent of something that looks like a tree amplitude, on, a loop amplitude on one side and a tree amplitude on the other side. Whereas this one is what we call the forward limit of scattering amplitudes. Um, uh, you see, if you have a one loop diagram, then also an internal loop can go on shell. So this internal line can go on shell. When that internal line goes on shell, I effectively cut the loop open and I add two more particles, okay? So that's a singularity, that's a pole that the amplitude has. So there's a pole of the one loop n particle amplitude, which is a tree amplitude with n plus two particles. And that's exactly what this is doing. If you remember, a n minus three is associated with n particles. So what we see here, is a n minus one, which is a n minus three plus two. So it's really adding two more particles compared to the number that we had to uh, begin with. And so at least we see that from this picture, it appears that if there is a connection with the amplitudes, the uh, connection will be, uh, the, 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 the connection should interpret the dn uh, case as one loop amplitude. And in fact, there's a nice interpretation of the BN and the CN as a certain special case of one-loop amplitudes where you just emit so-called tadpole diagrams. But, uh, but I don't need to uh, 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 describe that in uh, detail. Let me just show you what this looks like. Um, so, so here's a picture for uh, this kinematical space-time, now for the case of BN. Now, let me, uh, let me sort of guide your eye here. What you're supposed to see in this picture, if you focus on the red dots, you see if you're fo focusing on these red dots, you see two red dots connected to this one, connected to that one. That there is a little DN thinking diagram, little D4 thinking diagram. So this is uh, gonna be one loop four particle scattering. And then what I've, what I've done is just put in as we go via the time evolution from the quiver, every one of the new variables that we see by precisely the same rules as we had before. And in this case, you fill out, again, similarly, a chunk of what looks like a space time. Now you fill out a sort of larger chunk of it. And yes, the fact that, uh, that, that there are these two antennae in the Dinkin diagram means that on one end of this space time, there's like a double, uh, there's, it's like there's an extra degree of freedom that lives on this one end of this uh, uh, kinematical space time. But, uh, but it's very much a picture of uh, evolving as we go, one step at a time, and uh, and uh, so 
this is the kinematical space-time picture that you would associate with, uh, with D4. And you can very explicitly connect all the variables that we see here. So here are the variables uh, one and one tilde, for example. So these are variables that you would, uh, that you would uh, connect, uh, sorry, the, the, the variables at the ends here are what, I've, what we're calling Y. These are the variables that you would, that you would associate with loop variables. Um, whereas, uh, whereas, and uh, well, I'll talk about this in a little more, in, in a little more detail later. Uh, whereas uh, uh, the other variables out here correspond to the normal kind of prop. In other words, these are the propagators that you would associate with the loop. <clears throat> these are all planar diagrams. So Y1 is the propagator that sort of, uh, that, that, that it's a propagator that goes between these, uh, between two and three. Y2 is the propagator that goes between three and four and so on in this uh, picture. Um, <clears throat> whereas the Xs are the ordinary kind of propagators that we, that we see associated with the, uh, with the uh, trees. Okay, so, uh, so we could spend longer, a lot longer talking about this uh, picture, but, uh, but we're going to uh, more systematically understand where these things come from when we talk about, uh, when we talk about cluster algebras in a little, little in, a, in, a, in, in a bit. Another general point I want to make is that, uh, is that uh, these diagrams include, you know, very things that we normally don't, would, might be tempted to throw away, like these tadpole diagrams. But you can't throw them away from this point of view. Um, uh, you know, this tadpole diagram, normally you think when you integrate, you have to throw it out or do, do, or do something with it, ignore it somehow. But it's absolutely crucial to keep all of these things in order for the entire structure to make sense. Uh, and uh, so there's actually some little annoyance with how you have to deal with, uh, with these things. Um, but uh, uh, there's a minor annoyance in how you have to deal with them, but I'm not gonna uh, I'm not gonna talk about that. Um, okay, so this is just to show you that we can uh, that <clears throat> that uh, all the Dinkin quivers are associated with some kind of polytope. So there's one for E6, E8, F4, G2, all of them. Uh, the only Dinkin diagrams that have an n in it that you can interpret as an n for a number of particles um, are the classical types. And all the classical types, A and B and C and DN, are actually uh, related to scattering amplitudes through to one loop. Okay, so um, good. All right, so uh, let me make. Can I ask yeah. you a quick question? Yeah. Uh, so, is there any uh, any relation between the roots of this algebra and the the one form that you use to define the positive geometry? Oh, well, there's there's a there's a uh, there's very much a relationship between the roots and the algebra and these uh, and these normal vectors that we drew, and we'll be talking more about that in a little bit. Okay. Um, okay. So let me make uh, let me make a final comment. I think I, I made this comment, um, uh, but uh, I, I made this comment before. But um, uh, let me let me just try to. Let me try to say it again. Um, so, so, so we see that uh, with, so let me uh, repeat. So with AN, this is trees. Trees for the phi cube theory. Uh, BN and CN, these turn out to be uh, so this is trees. These turn out to be trees, but where you can emit a loop that looks like a tadpole. Dn is just honest one loop, summing summing everything. Okay, so one loop and trees. They have tadpoles and everything. Um, what are the exceptionals? We don't know. What do they mean? Well, we know what they are as polytopes. We don't know if they have any. Uh, we don't know if they have any physical meaning. And we're going to spend some time talking about what multi-loop here means. And this is going to be associated with uh, with the cluster algebras in general of punctured surfaces. And I'll say a little bit. Well, we'll 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 
talk about that, but there's a number of interesting new issues that uh, show up. Um, Why is that word? Sorry. Uh, no, we don't. You don't know. You don't know what that word uh, means yet. Okay, I'm just. I'm just uh, foreshadowing. We'll. We'll talk about it. We'll. We'll talk about it a little bit more. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Notice that all of these things involve factorization of some interesting type. For example, the E6 case has some funny factorization because you know you have this uh, um, where I have something that looks like this, and it has a factorization where you remove this middle node and it factors into three things and not just two things. Okay, so uh, the fact that you factor into two things is very much a space-time process picture. But in this more general setting, we have some slight extensions of that, which are kind of uh, interesting. And let me make a, 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 a final point. Um, all of these polytopes, all of these polytopes, are actually, are actually, oops. So remember, all these polytopes are given by, by some formulas that look like x plus x minus x minus x equals constant. A whole stack of formulas that look, look, look like this, okay? Um, so all of these polytopes, all these polytopes are naturally uh, expressed as Minkowski sum. Now, in fact, this is a, even if you didn't know this, there's a very reasonable way that you would discover it. Because what we always do in physics, whenever we have any source, right, there's a very standard idea. If you want to solve some problem for general source, first solve for a delta function source. When you solve for a delta function source, that's like the, so, uh, solving for a delta function source is like the Green's function. And you can then solve for the general source by taking a sum of these, right? So it's very natural to ask what happens, the analog in our mesh picture here, the analog in the picture we drew, it's natural to ask what happens as you take this picture, say, what happens if I turn off all of the C's other than the one in there? Okay, well, I have some general isosahedron, but if I turn off, if I set all the C's to zero, but the C in, in one place, obviously I'm gonna degenerate it a lot. And, <laughs> We can actually see what happens uh, pretty easily in the case of n equals five. If we do the case of n equals five, <clears throat> so here we have a pentagon that looks like this, but you can see that <coughs> you can see that what happens as you degenerate uh, the the C is that if you send all but one C to zero, you can either get something that looks like a triangle or one little interval or another little interval. Okay, so you would get, for example, you set some of the C's to zero, you might just get that triangle. Or if you set some of the other, the other C to zero, you'll get this interval, or you'd get that interval. So degenerating the C's, in this case, degenerating these three C's, takes the pentagon and it breaks it up either into a triangle or into an interval or another interval. And the Green's function idea tells you that you should be able to build the pentagon as a sum. It's a sum of a triangle plus an interval plus an interval. But what should this notion of sum be? Well, it's the only notion of sum we have when we talk about polytopes. This is the Minkowski sum. that we talked about before. And we can see that it's true. If I take this picture, what is the Minkowski sum of this triangle with this interval? What it means is I just add everything that's in this triangle to every vector that's in this interval. 
Well, that's just taking this triangle, shoving it all over, and it gets me this quadrilateral. And what do I get when I further add that to that integral? It's like taking this quadrilateral and just lifting it. And doing the sum of all of these things gives me the whole, oops, I did it wrong. Giving the sum of all that gives me, uh, gives me the uh, pentagon. So, you, so, so in other words, if you take this little triangle, uh, this 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 little triangle, Minkowski sum, <clears throat> the two intervals, it precisely gives me the uh, pentagon that we uh, that we get in the end. More precisely, uh, as usual with the, with the Green's function, you have to normalize it. So, if you put each c here to one, and you put the other c to zero. Then what I have to then the final pentagon is actually uh, is actually C C1. I don't know if I have the right ones here, plus C2 plus C3. So I have to weight each piece of the Minkowski sum by the by the corresponding C's, where I've defined these guys to be what I get when I set everything to zero except one of them to one. Okay. Okay, so that is uh so so that that's uh, uh so again this 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 kinematic space-time picture. Uh, makes it very natural to ask what happens when you shut off all the C's but one C. Uh, and what you find is a degeneration of the picture. It's a much simpler shape um, with the full object being the sum of them uh, in the usual way that we're familiar with with these signs. So that means that this polytope and all of these polytopes, from all of the Dinkin diagrams, all of these polytopes are naturally. Minkowski sums. And Minkowski sums are very specific things, very specific things that we get from the degenerations of these, uh, from the degenerations of these uh, equations. So that means that there's a very canonical way that we can uh, get the canonical form for these polytopes. To get the canonical form, we just write them as a Minkowski sum. Take the Newton, take the polynomial associated with each sum end of the Minkowski sum, which is completely locked, and then build the stringy canonical form. Product of all of these PJs to the minus alpha prime CJ. That's what we're supposed to do to get the. Uh, 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 now we know if we do this, as alpha prime goes to zero, we're guaranteed to get the canonical form for the polytope we're talking about. So that's that's a very nice invariant way of getting it. But the beautiful thing is that at finite alpha prime, if you do this for our favorite case of the isosahedron. This integral is nothing other than the Coben Nielsen formula for string amplitude. Okay, so uh, so that's that's a little more detail what I what I uh, what I said uh, uh, before the break. So let's just sum up where, where we got to. We want the kinematic space. There seems to be nothing happening there. We just have these xij's, but we started anyway. We uh, tried just tried to represent all the xij's so that the action of the cyclic symmetry on the variables was as manifest as possible. And that brought to life this causal structure in the kinematic space. And the causal structure, for example, nicely interpreted the notion of whether uh, propagators were compatible or incompatible with each other by relating it to whether the corresponding points in kinematical space were the past and future tips of a of a causal diamond that fits in the kinematic space. And motivated by that, we asked a dynamical question. The only kind of dynamical question you can ask in one plus one dimension, the solution of the free wave equation. And we asked for it to have some positivity properties, and that brought to life the this isosahedron in kinematical space. Um, 
<clears throat> we then ask for a differential form on the space of all of the xijs that has the property that when you pull it back to the solution of the wave equation, what you get is the canonical form for the corresponding associohedron that you find there. And that's the scattering amplitude. That's the scattering form. And when you pull it back to the subspace, what you get after you strip off this devolume form in front is the actual scattering amplitude. Um, <clears throat> uh, we then abstracted away uh, a very natural notion of uh, time evolution in kinematic space and represented it as a simple uh, set of, uh, as a simple mutation rule on quivers. And in the process of doing that, uh, uh, having done that, we could talk about this notion of time evolution for any kind of quiver, not just the sort of uh, quivers that look like linear chains that we got from this kinematic space. But amazingly, it turns out that's a very restricted problem for it to eventually close, for this time evolution to eventually stop. And uh, the only quivers that it stops for are associated with Dinkin diagrams. And all of those, all the classical types um, actually have a role to play related to scattering amplitudes. Um, the, the, the magic of the kinematical space picture is that it made obvious that there was something, that there was a polytope that factorized on its boundaries into other polytopes of the same type. That was what we were trying to make manifest. That's what's not made manifest by particles and strings, but did become manifest from this picture. That generalizes to these other Dinkin diagrams uh, and the kind of factorizations that are involved which, remove just remo which involve just removing nodes of these Dinkin diagrams are very simply interpreted as the factorizations we need for, uh, for amplitudes through the one loop. And finally, the very presentation of these objects, the very association with these kinematical spaces, these uh, solutions with evolving one step at a time, uh, makes it very natural to think about what Green's functions look like in this space. And it tells us if these complicated polytopes are built out of the sum of very simple, uh, much more simple uh, building blocks in exactly the same way as a general solution to, to, uh, to the wave equation as a linear combination of solutions with delta function sources. Um, <clears throat> and that presentation of the polytope as a Minkowski sum immediately yield, immediately lends itself to the uh, stringy canonical form representation for, uh, for the canonical forms. And remarkably, for the isosahedron case, um, that string economic form is nothing other than the actual string amplitudes, the, Cob the Cob and nielsen amplitudes. So we really have a picture where just starting more abstractly in kinematic space, we discover this positive geometry, we discover, that we, we, we discover the corresponding uh, canonical forms. One presentation of the canonical form is known as Feynman diagrams. You sum over all the vertices. That's one of the standard ways of computing canonical form is Feynman diagrams. Another way of computing the canonical form by a string canonical form is the string amplitude, is the Coben Nielsen amplitude. There are many other ways of representing the answer. And, uh, and furthermore, this hidden projective invariance of the answer, as well as a number of other features, become, become manifest in this uh, presentation. Um, so that's all. Uh, so uh, all of those things are true for the, uh, for the usual sosahedron case. Uh, it's a fascinating question. We can talk about these string economical forms and the analog of these string amplitudes also for these other Dinkin diagrams, like DN. That means we have a set of objects that have an alpha prime attached to them. And when alpha prime goes to zero, they're related to amplitudes, they're related to one loop amplitudes, but we don't know what their meaning is at non-zero alpha prime. In particular, it seems crazy for them to be utterly disconnected from real string theory amplitudes because they have all the same magical properties, even at finite alpha prime. They factorize, they do all the things that we, many, all the qualitative things that we associate with the magic of string theory are also done with these, uh, with these, uh, with these objects, but we don't yet know what the relationship to the full, um, uh, to, to, to real string amplitudes are if they have one. Um, so th there's a large number of open, open questions there, but the, but the zero thought of summary was, uh, I hope you got out of this exercise uh, a sense for what it is that we're after. Again, we started with this very blank seeming canvas of the space of XIJs and a little bit of structure of ordering and the notion of positivity gave just enough structure on that space to be able to discover this whole rich structure. Um, uh, and that's kind of a template for the kind of uh, things that we have in mind uh, going forward. All right, so uh, maybe we can take uh, another break. Um, the next subject I wanted to talk about is cluster algebras. Um, uh, uh, really proper. Um, 
And part of the reason is that if we want to, if we want to uh, go on beyond one loop, so far we've gone as far as we can, quite, we've gone quite, quite, quite far, um, just based on intuition about what this kinematical space looks like and, and making guesses about things like wave equations and so on. But um, it's not an accident that the things that we found are related to cluster algebras. It's not remotely an accident. And it's actually a really good idea to know why they're related to cluster algebras. Um, uh, because that, that will give us, uh, uh, that'll give us a kick in the right direction to trying to figure out how this uh, story for phi cube theory works to all loop work. Okay? Okay? So, uh, should we take another, another break? Uh, let me actually see how many people are still online. Um, so we're now at the, we're now at the uh, six hour mark, so. Oh, 80 people, not so bad. Well, of course, they might not all be here. Uh, so, okay. Um, <clears throat> okay. 